All right, so today we'll be talking to my buddy. We were friends in Shanghai, and he never left. So he's been there throughout this whole COVID ordeal. And I just want to see what is going down. This is him. So this new round of lockdown, some cases of the Omicron started to pop up in Shanghai. And then at first, did the government say, all right, we're going to do like a four-day lockdown and try to get this completely under control? So that's how it started here was a couple people started to get locked down for two days and then they said well it's still spreading and they basically wanted us to lock down for four days some people said two weeks and currently this is day 53 of our four-day lockdown wow and this lockdown seems a lot more severe than lockdowns we've had in the US. Can you run us through like what the rules have been? There's a couple things to kind of understand about China first. So every apartment complex has a neighborhood committee and that neighborhood committee are are party members that live in your building and they're kind of, you know, the the eyes and ears for what's going on in your area. And so the government has put those people in charge. And that's why we're seeing a lot of kind of problems because there isn't really a policy. There's a very vague general policy to keep the numbers down. And so what's happening in different places is some of them are being like chained in, like box, uh, bike locks uh, on the gates. They're building fences around people's houses. That's not happening in my complex um, because my my uh, neighborhood committee hasn't decided to do that, but they've kept us in for 53 days. Like I'm not allowed to leave my apartment every day, um, 12 o'clock. I can put my garbage outside and someone comes and picks up the trash. So in the last 53 days, the only times you've left the house is either to take out your trash or to get a test. Yeah, and take out my trash is only open my door and set my trash outside. Oh, I thought they would have you walk down. No, I put it outside my door and then someone comes to my door and sprays it with a Ghostbuster gun of bleach and then they carry it down. Damn. We're allowed to order food through group orders, which means we have to organize uh, among ourselves. So we have chat groups with our with our building and someone will be like looking and say, oh, we got butter. Can we get like a hundred people to buy butter? And, and then we can have butter. We got Shake Shack. This was ridiculous, man. Shake Shack, the minimum order, a thousand US dollars. So you have to get enough people in your building to order Shake Shack and it comes a week later and it was just like ice cold. So you have to order a week later, a week later. Yeah. So you have to be like, you know, you know what? Next Friday night, it would be sick to have Shake Shack and then find enough people in the building. I'm sure a lot of people in your building are Chinese and may have never heard of Shake Shack. Exactly. So does all your food have to be ordered a week in advance or are there some places where you could place an order at lunch and have that for dinner? No, there isn't. And also those restaurants I named, like Melrose Pizza, Taco Bell, Shake Shack, KFC, those are about the only ones that have been allowed to be open. So most of the most of the groceries that you're getting or, or food you're getting is groceries. And it, most of it is random. So you pay 20 bucks for, for vegetables and you'll get two big bags filled with random vegetables. So, okay. you know, sometimes it's like, like, what did we get one time? We got two pounds of bok choy, one pound of chives, two tomatoes, and a potato. And it's like, what do I do with this? I mean, I guess that's kind of healthy. <laughs> <laughs> so the groceries take a week as well. Yeah, and some don't show up. And you have to buy everything in huge quantities. So we bought like 40 eggs and then... The eggs didn't come for two weeks, so we ordered 40 more eggs. So now we have 80 eggs. I'm so sick of eggs. Like, (laughs) so sick of eggs. Are there ways to get meat? Yeah. Actually, I forgot to mention we also get government deliveries. And uh, I'll show you this delicious meat that I got. So I don't know if you ever tried this thing. 
Yes, I have. Oh my god. Oh my so bad. Shanghai, where does it say? Shanghai flavored red sausage. Also oh. got this. This is Chinese spam. So you got we got um like one of these a week. So this is no matter how big your family is, the government gave you one can of fake spam or this nasty sausage. It makes bologna look like filet mignon. It's like that. Yeah, it's not. That is it's true. not me. Now, have you guys had to take COVID tests almost every day in your apartment complex? Yes. So many COVID tests. So we have like the the little self tests. We have to self test before we go downstairs to do the actual test. I'm not sure why, um, but so I I've probably taken. Well, I've taken a test almost every day for 53 days. I would say going downstairs to take the test. Um, maybe I've done that 40 times. So not every day. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really funny because they don't want us to be next to each other. They have, um, you know, six feet apart, like dots painted on the ground to keep us apart. But then they put us all in the elevator at one time. So they jam us into the elevator and then they bring us outside and then they're like six feet apart, six feet apart. Even your, even my wife, I can't stand next to my wife in line, but then boom, jammed in the elevator with 15 people. It's crazy. And so now we kind of, we've seen a change. So in the, in the beginning, like the first couple of weeks in the group chat, everyone was, was saying, oh, we're not like America. Like, listen, how good our country is giving us vegetables and taking care of us. In two weeks, we'll be back to normal. And now the mood has changed significantly where people are complaining. So actually, most of the people refuse to go downstairs to get tested, which, you know, from being in China, that's like a big deal. People don't really go against the government here. It's the first time I've seen it in nine years. So can you walk me through what happens when you um, go out for your neighborhood test in the morning and test positive? So I can tell you in my building, there was actually someone who was building the COVID camps for the government, and he was curious to see how it looked. So they led him out to go check it out. And he came back, surprise, surprise, and brought COVID to him and his family. So he got sent back to the camp to get the inside view. Um, Jeez. <laughs> yeah, but how it worked was they came back and said, we have an abnormal test result. And everyone said, what does abnormal mean? Do you mean positive? And they said, we don't like to use the word positive. We like to use the word abnormal. And then everyone was saying, well, who you know, who got it? It became a little bit of a, a witch hunt in the chat. And then the the head of the committee got tired of dealing with people. And she's like, OK, I won't tell you the apartment, but it's the fourth floor. And then someone on the fourth floor said, well, it's not me. And the apartment next to me is empty. And then the other person said, well, it's not me. So we figured out who it was. And then people were demanding that this person be taken away and sent to the camp. And so that person, you know, they showed up, got into a bus, taken away um, for two weeks. And since since the two weeks is up, they're back now. Um, but that's not always the case. So I have some friends that I know, they weren't allowed back in their building because actually the law is that you're supposed to be taken back after you've done your two weeks. But it's, again, the neighborhood committee's decision. And sometimes the neighborhood committee, they don't trust that they are, don't have COVID anymore. And they say, we don't want you. And so I know one guy that actually moved into a hotel because they won't let him back into his own apartment. And so now he has to actually pay for a hotel because um, he's a bit stuck. Damn. And what are the conditions like at these camps? Uh, there was this one dude on Instagram who was kind of just uh, live blogging everything he was going through there. Kind of just seems like one large room with a bunch of cubicle setups. And then there's kind of like a cot in each cubicle. 
sort of thing. Yeah. And believe it or not, those are the nice ones. Um, so they have the, the cubicles with the cots. They have the porta potty room. They give you uh, a couple of sheets and a, a little bucket to do your washing because they don't have showers. They've got a sink. They give you kind of a packaged meal that looks like a school lunch packet. Um, and you get a couple of bottles of water. And that's about it. My friends that have been there said, like, you know, they don't give you enough water. I think they give you enough food, but the food is is terrible. And they said the, they don't shut off the lights. So it's like huge bright lights in a stadium or something like that on all day. Super noisy, super smelly. And they actually have worse ones um, that are more temporary, kind of like a big tent. Like if you went to like a, a music venue and those huge tents and some of those collapsed with the rain when we had that kind of, you know, Shanghai downpours and everyone got soaked. The ground was muddy. Um, some people were in tents. They, they had a whole bunch of like mini tents that they set people up in. I mean, they just don't have enough space. Now they started to take over some schools and, and different things like that. And they're turning the schools into um, these kind of COVID camps because they just keep sending everyone. In fact, actually this week, there's a new policy where they said, if anyone in your building gets COVID, they want to send all of you to these COVID camps. So that's the big kind of new panic. So all of these people, imagine, you know, the buildings here are huge. Like my building is 26 stories and that's normal. That's average size. Everyone in the building sent to a COVID camp and then they come in and they, they spray an aerosol bleach in, on everything you own. They open up your closets, spray your clothes. So your clothes will, you know, be bleached. They'll spray your books or or whatever. It doesn't matter um, what you have. I have I know some people that um, they were helping volunteer with the testing, and they were standing near the guy spraying, and the clothes that was sticking out of their protection got bleached. I mean, it's aerosol bleach. And I feel yeah. like when you send the whole building to a camp, like you might have a few cases in the building but once you send all 26 floors there that's pretty much guaranteeing that everyone there is going to get it exactly i have on my instagram uh, i can send you the the audio directly but there was like these two american women this was just like this week and they were trying to take the whole building and they're just like no like we don't, we're not going because you're gonna make us get sick like we're not sick and so we've seen We've seen this now where actually some people are are peacefully protesting or however you want to say it, but they're refusing to go because they're not positive. And I know I've seen some videos where they've kicked down some doors. I don't know anyone that that that's happened to. And I think if it was a foreigner, they would probably be a little bit more careful about it. But I've been in some video calls on Zoom with the American embassy. And basically the embassy said there's nothing they can do. Their hands are tied. Um, so I don't know if that personally happened to me, what I would do. I think I would be afraid to not open up the door and, and I'm not sure what would happen. So I think I would probably go along with it. But I know some people, especially those with kids or with pets, um, they're, they're like, no, we're not, we're not going. And like, when you get sent to a camp, you're usually there for at least two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. You can bring a bag. Um, I have a, I have a bug out bag already packed. Like I have a jar of peanut butter. I have some of those, uh, weird beef jerky, Chinese kind of beef jerky. I have some, um, some kind of like powdered 
protein shake mix, just some things in there just in case the food is, you know, unbearable. It must be excruciatingly boring there. We had some of our coworkers get sent to those camps and it's it's a mental health crisis for them for sure. It also seems like the one person I saw who was at a camp, he didn't even have his own cubicle. They also like pair you up with just another random person. So you don't have any privacy there at all. I mean, it totally depends on which camp you get sent to. Like for example, those schools that they took over, you have a, some, sometimes the room is small, but if the room is small, you might have like five, 10 people in there. I mean, you don't get to choose those people. But another um, reason why they also put those camps is because the camps are, are mostly on the outskirts of town. So when they move all those people there, that means they don't count for the numbers in Shanghai. So they basically you could you could probably do like a satellite photo and see see the borders of Shanghai because it's all massive like temporary buildings that they they built up. This whole lockdown obviously it's tanking the economy, it's a mental health crisis, it's leading to political unrest, but they're still committed to the zero covid policy. Yeah, I mean, we thought okay, they care about the economy. Shanghai is like, you know, the international city. There's a lot of headquarters here. The eyes of the world are here. We thought that maybe that would change something. And then earlier this week, the, the WHO, they said in a very polite, very diplomatic way, China has done a great job, but zero policy um, doesn't work with, with COVID. So hopefully they can reconsider it. And I know I also shared that that um, clip on WeChat, the, the social media here, and it was up for about a day. A lot of people were posting it and it went down. And then Xi Jinping gave a speech and he reaffirmed this week that no, we will, we will conquer COVID and we, are staying with the the zero cases policy, which is yeah. really, really uh, kind of cranked up the the feelings here. Because when you don't have the hope or you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, that's when it becomes a lot more stressful. Let's talk about booze. Have you been able to get beers? Well, luckily, we we saw the writing on the wall, and we we stocked up big time. But actually, also a guy. I'm in the, the softball league. There's a guy in the softball league who's from Western China, from Xinjiang. And his job was, uh, he worked for a wine distributor. And so he saw what was happening and he signed up as a delivery guy on one of the food delivery apps because he saw the lockdown coming and only those people have permission to be outside. So he quickly signed up for that. And now he's the go-to guy. He's 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 doing alcohol, cartons of cigarettes and chocolate. He didn't even do that before, but he's just wheeling and dealing. He's got his scooter fully charged. And basically now it's it's hilarious in our groups. It's like anytime someone needs alcohol, we just call this guy and he somehow has the connections to get you whatever you need. This guy's a hero. I feel like they're going to make a movie about him after, like when this is all said and done. They need to. He deserves it. What are some of the horror stories that you've heard or that you can confirm like are real? Because obviously everyone in the U.S., we see crazy things online every day. And I mean, it seems like most of it is is actually real, but I'm sure there are some things that um, it's people just exaggerating stuff. I mean, you're well aware of your time here in China. The, the Western media tends to exaggerate or take unique, weird stories and in, inflate them. But I would say this is the first time where the stuff you're seeing on the news, I mean, is really happening. And the, the thing that maybe people aren't aware of is it's only happening to a small percentage. So maybe one or 2% of people in the whole city are having that kind of issues, but 2% is half a million people. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big, big city. So it's definitely not, for, it's not happening to everyone, but it is happening to a lot of people. And so I've, 
I've seen some pictures and things from friends about uh, pets. That's for sure one of the big issues. So what happens is if you go to those COVID camps, they didn't come up with a policy for your pet. So either they leave your pet in your apartment, even they'll spray the bleach and everything with your pet in there, and you're, no one's coming to feed your pet. Or some people like let their pet outside to like, you know, escape. And they, you know, the security guards there took sticks or brooms and just literally beat the dogs and cats to death or shoved them into bags. And I mean, I had friends that saw some of this stuff happening. And so that that doesn't seem to be happening now because once it became uh, an international news thing, they, they told people don't do that. It wasn't a policy from the government to kill the animals. It was, again, the neighborhood committee doesn't know what to do because there is no policy. So they made their own decision. So that, you know, that was something I heard a lot about. Something that, that's far worse that I, I have heard some about is the suicides. So I'll, I'll have to send you the video I took yesterday. I, I also posted it on Instagram of a woman just screaming bloody murder um, across, across my apartment. <laughs> saying, you know, I can't take this. I want to leave this country. I want to kill, 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 kill. And everyone in our building is messaging saying, someone needs to go there and talk to her because a lot of people are jumping out of their buildings and killing, um, killing themselves. We saw um, one of my students in their building, a whole family. So mom, dad, and two small kids, they all held hands and jumped out like 20 story building and, and killed themselves. I, a lot, yeah. A lot of old people as well because they don't let you go to the hospital. In some cases, they're not letting you go to the hospital. And so a lot of these, you know, 80, 90 year old people, they, they need medicine. And, and I, we read this story um, from someone my wife knows, where the, the dad, the dad killed himself because he couldn't get his pain medicine. And actually, the, the, the daughter was was our age and talked to my wife and said like they were messaging like someone needs to check on him someone needs to check on him and you know no one went and checked on him for a couple of days and he just he wrote a small message saying i can't deal with this pain medicine like without having the pain medicine like i'm old it's not worth living anymore um so he killed himself yeah that's that's been kind of the big thing especially maybe in the last few weeks because now we don't know when it will end. So I think in the beginning, people thought, oh, okay, two weeks. Yeah, we can deal with that. A month, yeah. we can deal with that. But for, for some people, they haven't been able to get food. Because, you know, those group buys, if you don't have enough people to buy the food, you can't get it. And some people live in small areas like the, the townhomes. The people that live in those town, the like row houses, sometimes they only have, you know, 10 units there. They, they can't spend a thousand dollars on Shake Shack. So they're not getting any food. Like actually two of my coworkers were down to a couple packets of instant noodles left and they were honestly panicking. And we, we called that guy, the alcohol guy I was telling you about. And we're like, we got to get this guy some food, like figure out a way. He snuck out of his apartment and went to the gate and our guy handed over a box of food to him but because like no one's you know no one's taking care of these people and so some of these some of these old old uh, chinese people mainly they're just like you know it's not worth it i'm 80 90 years old i can't figure out how to use my phone to do these like group buys and things like that i don't have food i don't have my medicine I'm, i've got cancer things like that i'm just going to end it yeah, it seems like if you don't know how to use technology, you're kind of fucked during this lockdown because that's how most of it's done. A hundred percent. And even even those group buys I was talking about, like they're not open all the time. Like we had our alarm set at five 
5 a.m. Because sometimes you could only order for a 30 minute window. It like comes available. And then as soon as they get the max orders, it closes. So in my building, you know, I live in, I live in the city center. I have doctors and lawyers and stuff in my building. So all of these people are on top of their game. Like, you know, they're, they're doing the work for me. But if you live in an area that's like an older Chinese neighborhood, um, even like kind of where you used to live, there was a lot more like older buildings and older people. Those are the areas that are having the problems getting stuff. And that's also the, the places that are having these kind of suicides. And one thing you mentioned to me is that some Chinese media is saying that COVID came from the U.S. or it was like done by the U.S. government. Yeah, it's not some. It's all. Um the the story now is the the US military created covid and they released it in china to destroy china's economy this is not a a secret this is you know the media here is is controlled by the government and that's the that's the narrative i've had i've had coworkers that are chinese ask me like why the united states would do that um it's uh in the last 2 years the the feelings have really really shifted here in fact this is an another thing about in line to be tested most of chinese people they won't get within you know 30 feet from me because they see me as a foreigner they think somehow i have covid but then they ride the elevator with me because they don't want to wait for the next one yeah no i heard back when covid first broke out in china if they saw a foreigner walking down the street they would sometimes cross to the other side of the road. Yeah, I mean, there has been a lot of xenophobia. I've had more than a, a handful of incidents. I actually got attacked um, by a guy twice. The police came and everything. He pulled out a police baton. My wife is Korean. He was yelling at her saying she's betrayed her people um, and, and things like that. And it, it was unprovoked. And he just has this like hate for America now. And actually, he didn't know I'm American. He just knows I'm white. But yeah. for most, for most, most Chinese, they they think white people are Americans. That's so sad because when I was in Shanghai and I lived there for about about eight years, and I never really experienced any xenophobia or anti-Americanism. I mean, especially in Shanghai, which has always been a city very very open to the outside world and foreigners. Yeah, I've been here nine years and I've only experienced that in the last two years. I never, just like you, like it was always, you walk down the street, super easy to make friends. If you're out at the bar, play a dice game, like get involved in a random table, playing the, rolling the dice and things like that. It was awesome, man. Like I loved my life in Shanghai. I, I loved my life in China, but unfortunately, this is a different China now. Obviously, China doesn't want to be like taking the blame for all this, but I didn't know they were just going like they were pulling a 360 and being like, no, it was actually the U.S. government. Yeah, I don't remember seeing that the first year of COVID, but definitely now it's it's all the time. And they they have a new app here. And if you're a communist member, you need to subscribe to this app and with it we'll have our news articles and kind of it it gives you a score so like every article you look at it will count like did you look at five articles today then it has quizzes afterwards to like make sure that you read the information and then you can get a bonus point if you share those articles on another social media app so that also didn't exist before, but now a lot of Chinese people have that app. And if they're a communist member, they have to have it. And so a lot of my friends that are Chinese, you know, they're always asking me questions like, you know, questions like why would America, you know, put COVID into China? Why do they hate us so much? Why do they want to do that to us? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then they show me like, here's the news article. Like this is, this is coming from our scientists that have proven that COVID came from America. On the app, if you share that article, you can kind of earn 
brownie points with the party? Yeah, yeah. My friends that have the app, they say that they spend about an hour a day on the app and it takes about an hour to get the max points. You, I mean, they don't say you need to have the full score. It's not forced on you, but there's that kind of social pressure of, well, who's going to get the next job promotion? The one that's always reading the articles or the one that's not. So basically everyone's reading that. And I can tell you, I've noticed a shift in some of these people I've been friends with for, you know, nine years where before they would see those articles and they would kind of be like, yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, that's not true. But I think slowly over time, by reading these articles every day, like they might not believe everything about it, but they're starting to believe parts of it. And it's definitely, definitely been a shift um, here. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize the, the attitudes here from when you left. You mentioned that some Chinese people are starting to complain have they been trying to crack down on like wechat posts or weibo posts which is chinese twitter where people are complaining about the lockdown yeah so like you'll see if you check the your moments like where people post on wechat it will be all like these videos of like what's going on and then you click on the video because the thumbnail will show the video like you'll see a picture of the video but when you click on it you know it's a 404 error or it says says like this person has deleted this content but they didn't delete the content and so what what's been kind of funny about this is it's almost like a game so people will like download the video and then record it so that it comes up as a different video and they try to like everyone keeps reposting it to try to stay ahead of the, the sensors because the sensors are a little bit delayed. Like it takes them probably about an hour to, to do it. So, I mean, it's honestly, it's sometimes it's kind of funny to see like, cause you envision just like, you know, someone behind on the keyboard, like frantically trying to take down these videos and then they keep like um, popping up. Personally, I, I'm not really posting those videos cause I want to get out of here and I, I don't want any trouble. But the, the, like a lot of the Chinese friends I have, they no longer care. Yeah, they didn't have any problems with the government beforehand. After two months of doing nothing, your brain starts to wander and you're like, you know what? Maybe fuck these guys. I mean, imagine they spent two years building this propaganda case that said, we're the ones that beat COVID. Like, because actually life was great here. And all of the messages would be like, look at the rest of the world. Look at Australia. Look at the UK, look at America, the people on the streets protesting, they don't care about their people. We care about our people here. And then now there's like this threat to it because Omicron can't be handled the same way. And so I think that's why they're being so stubborn to give up because they were pointing the finger at everyone else saying they can't handle this. And so now it's, it's really kind of threatening this whole thing that they worked two years on. The government's worried if they say, you know what, we just have to learn how to live with COVID. They're almost admitting that the West was right. That's totally what's happening right now. And they're willing to even, you know, sacrifice the economy to some extent for that ideological um, edge. And right now, like just from talking to friends and like looking at a lot of polls online, pretty much foreigners are leaving. So a lot of the things that we saw, if they're not leaving this summer, which I would say about half of the foreigners are leaving this summer, I would say about 80, 90% are leaving within a year. Do you need to wait yeah. like for the, the lockdown to be, to be over, to fly back? In order to get out, you've got to get permission from the neighborhood committee, the people in the building, they have to sign a form. Then you're supposed to go to the hospital and get a, a test ahead of time. Um, once you get all those approvals, then you have to book a car, which is normally about 50 bucks. But right now I've seen it as high as a thousand dollars. And okay. then, and then you have to hope that your flight's not canceled. I know a lot of people that have been booking like five different flights and just going there, hoping to get out. So you work as a teacher. What's been happening with the schools? Have you been teaching from home? Yeah, 
Oh man, I forgot about telling you this story. You'll love this story. So one of my one of my students, it started out kind of scary. So we got a message saying, "Has anyone talked to the to this student, sixteen year old uh, guy? Has anyone talked to this student?" And we're like, "No. What's going on?" And they kind of kept it hush hush. But um, that night, the parents said they got in a fight with the kid, and the kid left, and he didn't take his phone. We don't know where he is. And so the teachers are kind of talking about it. They're like, we don't want to panic anyone. Um, but has anyone talked to this kid? Then the next day comes in the morning and he still hasn't showed up. And, you know, for us, I, we were already talking about the suicide things. Like, honestly, in my mind, I was talking to my wife and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do if this kid ends up washed up in a river jumping off a bridge. I was like, there's no way that, like, how is this kid like making it? There's police all over. Like, how has he not been caught by someone? What's going on? And, you know, they have cameras everywhere. They alerted the police and the police saw the police saw him crossing two like major roadways, but then they couldn't find him. And then a, it was almost two full days. They finally find him and it's like, okay, he's alive. Thank God. And then I message him and I'm like, where were you, man? And he goes, I tried to, I tried to escape. So he, he took a wad of cash from his parents in a backpack. He took his passport. He, he went straight, he busted out of like his lockdown in his building. And he found one of those like, you know, like rental bikes, the bike share. He found one that had like the lock jimmied open and he rode the damn bike to the airport. To the That's Pudong like, airport? To the Pudong Airport. He rode it was an bike. hour drive. It's an hour drive. He rode his damn bike. And he was like, occasionally he would stop by some of the, the buildings that were on lockdown and ask the guys, like, which way is the airport? And eventually, once he got to one of the like major highway roads, he could find the signs. And he biked all the way to the airport. And you know, he's a kid, so he doesn't understand how it works. He showed up and he, you know, he pulled out his passport and his wad of cash. And he's like, I want the next flight out of here. And they're like, that's not how it works. You got to, you got to buy a ticket online. Like, what are you doing here? And then we have all of our, um, all of our COVID like test information on our phones. And so they're like, show me you don't have COVID. And he's like, oh, I don't have my phone. Just let me in. And the guy's arguing with the airport to let him in and eventually you know he just gives up and they let him go which is a shock and so he doesn't know where to go he's just biked all the way you know it's normally an hour drive so he's like i don't have enough energy to to get home so he just starts walking around the airport because it's it's locked down there's not many people there and he just starts jimmying open different doors and he finds a door open he gets into the airport and he finds a little like medical building or like, you know, a nurse station or something like there. And he sets up the chairs and he makes a little camp for himself. And he spent the night there. He had food in his backpack and water. And then he gets up the next day. He tries to book a flight again. He say no. And then he's like, okay, I, I better uh, go back. So he rides his bike back. And then he's like, they have cameras. They have police everywhere. You're not supposed to be outside your apartment. They're going to catch me right away. And then I'm going to go home. And then they didn't catch him. So he's like, I don't know what to do. He wanted them to catch him because he wanted to go home. But he had too much pride to like roll up at home and say like, hey, mom, I'm back. So he just started rolling around. He went to Lujaw's Way where like the Pearl Tower and the skyline. Yeah. He just went biking around all the sites of China because he was looking for food and water. He didn't have any more food or water. And, you know, after like, two days, like all places are closed, right? Everything is closed. So he's, you know, he's just rolling around. He does. He said he didn't even know where he was because, you know, it's all tall buildings and he didn't have his phone. And he's just like, why are they not catching me? And yeah, finally I'm they, surprised they people at the airport him. didn't, didn't like call the cops. Unbelievable, man. I, I'm guarantee if he was a foreigner, well, I mean, he is a foreigner, but he's Asian. He has an Asian face. 
I, I'm guarantee if it was you rolling around, you probably wouldn't make it very far. No. What a trooper that kid is. He's like, I wonder if they'll they'll write an article for the school newspaper. I'll write an article about him. Well, thanks for talking to me. I'm thinking of you guys and praying for the best. Yeah, thanks, man. Hopefully uh, we can meet up somewhere around the world here one of these days.